okay, I want you to work on the management, the management end instead. And at the time, he was managing San Holo. He listed like a hundred things and was like, I need you to do all of this. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is what being a manager is. <laughs> this is not what I expected. And it was a whole range of random things from like, Publishing administration, like registering every all the all the oh. all the stuff from all the clients into like different databases. Light just hit a hundred million yeah, yes, yesterday. Huge. Me and San had a little moment. I think <laughs> it was really cute. Hi, this is Lauren Engel of Sidewalk Talk today. I'm with Jeff. Hi. Also, thank you for like initially finding Sidewalk, I guess, and like setting up the sun. Yeah, I'm like trying to think of when I first first saw Sidewalk Talk. It must have been on r slash trap, but I saw... Yeah, they've been... I think it was the Getter it. interview and I was like, oh, yo, yeah. this is tight. Like, the Getter one. Let's get on. <laughs> so you were born in Toronto? I was. I was born in Toronto. Uh, I was born in a suburb called North York, which is like... I think it's still part of Toronto, actually. Um, but yeah, my parents are from Hong Kong. Yes, I think you're... Are you the first person I've interviewed from Hong Kong? Maybe, yeah. Maybe, because Haley's from Taiwan. So oh. I might be the first Hong Kong person. We yeah, have like a little... well, there's only like a few people, like Mern, and then Haley from Asia. Like yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I've there's there's not that many of us. I think it's it's funny because on the San Holo crew, there's like me and Haley, and it's really weird to there's be like two Asians in like one spot. Yeah. So we always have a little moment when I see Haley, and it's like, <laughs> hey, my Asian brother. But uh. And then you went back to Toronto. Okay, so I was born in Toronto, and then when I was one month or like two months old. My parents moved back to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. so I was there for a year, and then I moved to Beijing when I was like one, and I was oh. there until I graduated high school. Oh yeah, much. Yeah. yeah. Did you already like start listening to music when you were in Beijing? Yeah, yeah. Like I think a lot of people are like really confused when I'm like, oh, I grew up in Beijing, because they're because the first like the natural question is like, how can you speak like really good English? And I'm like, well, I went to international school, so I yeah. think like I was born in, like a like a U.S. like a like a global culture, I guess. Like yeah. my parents, I get that too. Yeah, I, I, and I'm I know like you half do. I'm American. I'm like, I literally told you a second ago. I'm yeah, half you're American. Ha you're, you're happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I was listening to music since I, yeah, so I, since I was a kid. I guess my parents would play a lot of music, um, and I guess I kind of did too. And I had an older sister, so she would always listen to stuff when I was a kid. So then I would just like see what she was listening to. But how did you access music? Um, did you already have VPN from the onset? No, well back in the day you didn't need a VPN, like, I'm talking like, when I was like 11, 12 and stuff, like, there was just like, you could get like, bootleg, you know you get like bootleg DVDs all the time, like, there'd be like oh, bootleg CDs. Oh, CDs, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the first CD I bought was, was B by Common, I think this was like 2006, I was like 12. Oh. I saw the cover in like, a, like one of those like bootleg China, China stores and I was like, this looks cool, like, I don't know what it is, but I bought it. It was like 10 RMB, which is like a dollar at the time. <laughs> yeah. But um, that was like the first album I ever bought. It was bootleg. I'm sorry, Common. <laughs> Don't come after me. But um, yeah. And then that whole time you were just buying CDs. Did, was there a variety of CDs? Yeah, Asian? yeah. Like there was, there was definitely that. And then the iPod had just come out, like oh. I think around the same time. Or no, I think the iPod had come out like two years earlier or something like that. There was a kid on my school bus who had an iPod. And he was like a year older than me, and he would always listen to Linkin Park. And then he introduced me to Linkin Park because oh, I would be wow. like, "Like, what is that device? Like, what are you doing?" Because everyone on the everyone on like the school bus would be playing Game Boy, but this kid would be like, not playing Game Boy. He'd be listening to his iPod and be like, well, "Yo, like, what is that?" Like, yeah. So I would ask him what he was doing, and he would and he showed me Linkin Park, and that was a while ago. And then he started finding that from illegally downloading stuff. Or I'm was guessing. He I'm, still? I'm guessing like he probably like. I don't even remember now. Like you could have, you could have probably bought CDs and ripped them. Like, or LimeWire, I think, was around too. Yeah. Like really early LimeWire days. Maybe like. Oh, the that's end of, allowed in. China. Yeah, that was available in China. Like the whole VPN thing in China didn't really come about till I remember. I was in, I was in tenth grade when they blocked like Google, oh. um, Facebook, YouTube, all that stuff. So I was in tenth grade. So that would have been like 2010. Before yeah. that, pretty much the internet was open. Yeah. It was just slow as fuck. Slow as hell. <laughs> I don't know, I should be sorry, but yeah. And then, so I guess you just did have access to like all these CDs. Were you ever like, try, like wasn't able to find certain music? Or you pretty much kind of had the same access to like an American one? I would say we, I definitely had the same access. Like, because LimeWire was available and like, mm -hmm. LimeWire was like, like LimeWire changed my life, I think. Like there was like yeah. so much stuff I downloaded <laughs> on LimeWire. I sound so bad to be saying this since like there I used remember- There used to be more shout out yeah. interviews because all the producers used to Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then like in the summers every year I'd come back to Toronto and then I would just like 
go to like CD, like I don't know, like like CD stores, like in the mall or stuff. Like when I was with my parents, like mm -hmm. I would do that every summer. So I felt like I was kind of culturally relevant. Like I was understanding what was culturally relevant in the states and Canada at the time, just because mm -hmm. I would go back at least once a year. Did you always know that you would go to college in Canada? Yeah, uh, yes and no. Like I applied to a couple schools in the states. I applied to a couple schools in Canada, but I always knew I'd be going back to North America. Oh, yeah. um, I settled in Toronto, I guess, because it was cheaper because I'm a, I'm, I still, I'm a Toronto citizen because yeah. I'm still by birth. Yeah. So it's cheaper. Um, and I just really like the city. Like, I would go back every year and I have a lot of, I've always had like the rest of my extended mm -hmm. family there except my parents. So it's always felt like home to me. So it was pretty easy to me to be like, like Toronto is cheap. Like, it's a good city. Like, sure, like Toronto. Mm -hmm. And actually in Beijing, were there like performances or like any artists that you look up to like? Yeah, I saw Calvin Harris when I was in 11th grade. Oh wow. That was like kind of like a game changer. I, I know Avicii had also come around the time I was in 10th and 11th grade. I didn't go, but I, I think everybody else in, the, in the, my entire grade went except me. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember why I didn't go. I just remember not going. Yeah. Um, and then like Steve Aoki would come. I think Rehab came too. But there was certainly like EDM concerts once once in a while, and then, and then like oh like I don't think I ever went to any other concerts besides like Steve Aoki and like Calvin Harris. But like that was cool. <laughs> I saw Calvin Harris a long time ago. That was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. This is like right after the second album came out. Oh. So it was ages ago. What did he study in college? I studied political science, actually. Why? Uh, I like <laughs> politics. I, I felt like it was interesting. Yeah. I liked arguing with people and um, actually, politics. Actually, what do your great... parents do? So my mom retired when I was born. Before mm -hmm. that, she was working in the Can she was working in the, like the local provincial Canadian government. Oh my god, same as my mom. Yeah, you're, you're Canadian. I don't know. She just did. In yeah, Hong it's Kong, so random. Canadian consulate. Wait, yeah, and my mom also worked for <laughs> the Hong Kong government, which is like really random because I didn't realize you could work for two governments or something. I don't know. Like that, that seems weird to me. My dad was at this accounting firm called Ernst and Young for a very, very long time, and he retired like a couple years ago. But you always felt like you had more of a creative side to you. I you guess didn't like really no. I didn't really know. Like I would. Like to this day, like I'll still say, like I don't think I'm a super creative person, like, and I'll probably stand by that. I just think that there is like certainly things that are more interesting than what I was doing in school, and like, I, like international school culture, I think is really weird. Like a lot of people I grew up with, like that are in high school, sorry, that I went to high school with and stuff, they're all like investment bankers, or they're all like doctors and stuff, Same. or like, yeah, I mean, you would know, and it's, it's really interesting when there's like a kid in the arts, and I felt like that's like a huge chip on the shoulder mm -hmm. that I just had, and I was like, oh, I, I don't want to be like working in KPMG or something like that, no hate to those guys, yeah. but like, I just felt like I could do something more interesting if I really, really put my mind to it, mm -hmm. so yeah. But studying political science, what career do you think you would have after that? I initially? wanted, yeah, yeah, so... When I was in high school, I did model the United Nations because I like debating and stuff. Oh. So I wanted to work, yeah, like in the foreign office. And then I guess like deep, deep down, I think it'd be really sick if I worked for like the Canadian version of the CIA. I think that'd be the most badass job of all time as like a, as like a desk analyst, like a policy analyst. So like that's my secret like goal when this whole music thing's done. I'm going to go work and become like the Canadian CIA. Damn, we're actually so similar because I did international affairs and I said you're brought at the UN. Yeah, see, hell? it's it's that's funny actually because there's I think a lot of international school kids are like that. I think yeah, it's part of that culture of being like this is so ironic, like a global citizen. Like mm -hmm. like my teachers used to always say that. Such yeah, a, such a dumb phrase. But, <laughs> but yeah, like I guess that kind of played into it. Mm -hmm. And then how did you? So you found Salacious Sound, or how did that? Yeah, happen yeah. So initially with your music. Sure. So when I was in, so I would I guess like among my friends when I was like in high school and middle school I guess like I feel like there's always like that one friend in the friend group who always like listens to really weird stuff and tries to get everybody else to listen mm -hmm. to that too that kind of was me um and then when I started school like I started like reading blogs more and stuff like this is right around like the hype machine era mm. uh, and there was like blog house and stuff and I was like reading all these blogs and then I came across this blog called Salacious Sound and like just by like pure chance it just happened the founders also went to the university of toronto oh same as same as me but they had graduated like i think they probably graduated right before i started before i started uh writing but i i just was like oh like this is cool like 
you can like write about music and like like and people actually read it so I was like why don't I do that so I just like literally applied and they were like okay or like whoever whoever like the direct contact was it was one of the founders he was like sure like so I just started blogging like I didn't really mm -hmm. know anything I didn't know that you could do like a press pass and stuff if you're a blogger yeah but I was just like like why don't I just write about music I have nothing yeah. better to do so it was just like a hobby like you weren't paid I was definitely like a hobby it was yeah I wasn't paid it was completely hobbyist yeah um and I also felt like it would help me get better at writing, so that's why I did it. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was a completely a hobby kind of thing, and I guess over time, I learned more about like the blogging culture, like where that fits in the whole ecosystem of like the music industry, but bef and and all that. But like back then, it literally was like, this looks cool, like why not? I have nothing better to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, you started. Work it, like doing stuff for the your EDM. Yeah, so I was with Salacious for like a year and a bit, and then like I learned about like the glory of the press pass, in which like in which you can go to a music festival for free. If in exchange, all you had to do was write about it, which I felt like was the best like single transaction kind of trade of all time. It was like yeah. I can go that see was me all with these photos. Yeah, it's like I can see all these artists for free, and all I have to do is write a two-page article. Like sure, <laughs> so I did that. I went to. I went to a couple festivals um, and then I, I like covered it all. Like you can actually read this. Just pr pr disclaimer: I actually use the press pass. And I actually wrote reviews. Just in case <laughs> any of those festival buyers are like, "What is this kid doing?" I actually <laughs> went and wrote shit. So, st so there. Yeah. Um, I went to this festival in Toronto. I think it was the summer of 2016 uh, or 20, 2015. Might have been 2015. And it was. It's called Veld. It's still. It's still. It's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. But I went there, and it just so happened that one of the like the gen the current general manager of your EDM he happened to be covering that festival too uh, for on behalf of your EDM this is like three years ago and I met him and we were just talking he was like are you blogging and I was like yeah like I'm with Salacious Sound he was like what do you like mainly blog about and I was like well, mostly electronic music and he was like oh like you should write with your EDM and I was like okay cool like sure like why not like I mm -hmm. like it just this is like right around the time that there was like three major EDM blogs. It was like DA, Dancing Astronaut, mm. EDM.com, and then your EDM. And I was like, I, I Googled it and looked at all the numbers. I was like, wow, like these guys have like, a giant reach. Like, why not? So I just, so I was like, sure. So then that's when I started writing for your EDM. And yeah, and again, it wasn't paid, but it was like, I felt like it was a level up in terms of like, I just like assume like based on the statistics and how big the blog was, it'd be easier to get into more festivals. Yeah. So I kind of I just kind of based my decision off of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was just writing this whole time. I was like second year of college, third year of college. Like I was getting to that point where like I was about to graduate in like a year and a half, and I still like didn't know what I wanted to actually do with political science. But I was so far into my degree, <laughs> I also didn't want to change degrees because I didn't want to do another year of yeah. school because. <laughs> I feel like, you know, having Asian parents and all, like, mm -hmm. their number one, like, dream of all time is, like, for, for your kid to, like, graduate college and then, like, become a doctor or something, yeah. or, or a lawyer. If I can't become a doctor or a lawyer, I can at least finish college. Yeah. That's what I was, like, that was my compromise. So I was like, okay, I'm going to finish school and then I'll figure out what I want to do. So then I was, like, writing and stuff, and then I was learning about this thing. I was learning more about Hype Machine, that thing I, I brought up earlier. Mm -hmm. And I was learning about the whole, like, music industry ecosystem. And then I learned that, like, if you're a blogger, it's really easy to become friends with other bloggers. And people actually pay bloggers to get... No, sorry. People actually pay other people to get bloggers to write about their music. And I was like, that seems simple. Like, the, the, the logic that, like, somebody would pay me to go talk to bloggers and have them write about a song was, like, mind-blowing for me. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to do that, and I guess I was okay at it. That's just, that's PR, right? Yeah, that's yeah. PR. That was, like, but I didn't realize it at the time, and I was like, wow, like, this is so weird. Like, people are paying me to talk to people pretty much, but yeah. I got pretty good at it. And then I did that for a year, and then... How are you finding clients? How was I finding clients at the time? Yeah. Yeah, through like literally word of mouth. Cloud producer stuff mostly. Yeah. Was it more of like a one-off case? Like if they yeah. had this song, like I'll pay you X amount and you just spam everyone. Yeah, literally. It was like <laughs> once like once a like I tried to go for like at least one thing once a month just so like it was like 
money coming in like semi-regularly as a college kid like I was just doing I wasn't I had like no other commitments besides school so I felt like I had a lot of free time to devote to like learning about the music industry yeah so it was kind of like it was kind of like that like I would try to get hit up like once every like couple weeks or so and then try and just do one campaign which would really just be at the time like message a lot of hype machine bloggers who had access to hype machine blogs mm -hmm. and get a lot of soundcloud reposts yeah and then just do that and like rinse and repeat mm -hmm. rinse and repeat and i guess i got pretty good at it mm -hmm. but that was that was literally it i don't feel like it was like anything like special <laughs> it was like really like just common knowledge like common sense i feel like mm -hmm. and then in my senior year uh booty who is still like san's manager and he's the ceo of heroic which is the company I work for, mm -hmm. he hit me up on Facebook or something and he was like, I've heard about you from like some other mutual people in the music industry that you've like worked with. I'm looking for like somebody to help me do PR on the record label that I run. Back in the day, Heroic was both a management company and, and a label. Mm -hmm. So he was like, I want you to work on the label. And at the time I was like, well, I'm getting, it's like halfway through my senior year and I'm like, I'm getting close to the end and I don't know if I'll be able to like jump full time into music, like just doing freelance stuff once in, like once in a while. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm just gonna take this and see where see where like see where it takes me. Mm -hmm. So I like I was like sure like I'll do that. So I worked on the label for like I did literally one release, and then he was like, okay, I want you to work on the management the management end instead. And at the time, he was managing Son Holo, uh, World, and Arc Patrol. So I was like, cool, I'll do that. Did you already know San Hollow like way before? I knew of his music, but I had never met him. Oh. Yeah. And then I knew of World's music via like Monster Cat, but I didn't know of, but I didn't like know him. Mm -hmm. And then Arc Patrol, I didn't know of till I, till I looked at the roster, till he showed me the roster and what oh. everyone was working on. But um, yeah, I guess like that was like the main selling point for him when he first like hit me up. He was like, I managed San Hollow and, and World and Arc Patrol and like, I have this cool record label and I was like, oh, like San Holo is like pretty popping. Like he's got like... Mm -hmm. Wait, how many years ago was this? This was just over two years ago. Oh, okay. So this pretty is 20... recent. Yeah, this is pretty recent. This is like January, February 2016. Oh, um, maybe I met him before you did then. <laughs> you probably did. Because yeah. um, the first time I met San was like right after. It was like March 2016. Mm -hmm. And I'd like just started working with Booty on the label, but not with him on San Holo Project. Mm. But um. Yeah, so that was like two years ago and a little bit, and I've been here ever since. Yeah, and then what kind of stuff did you start doing initially on the management end? Yeah, like I, more I, like day to day that people can learn about. Yeah, yeah, it's really funny. I remember because I was I was just talking to one of my uh, one of my colleagues about this, but I remember the first meeting I had with Booty where he was like moving me to management. He basically it was like a basically a forty five minute meeting, and he just gave me a bunch of he just like listed like a hundred things and was like I need you to do all of this, and I was like oh. Okay, so this is what being a manager is. <laughs> this is not what I expected. And it was a whole range of random things from like publishing administration, like registering every all the all the oh. all the stuff from all the clients into like different databases for like for like uh, performing rights organizations. And then it was like I need you to go like map out like a bunch of release dates and uh, then I need you to go check up on all these labels for all these like things I requested, like ISRC codes, which is like metadata for songs, and a whole bunch of just random like day-to-day -day stuff and I like literally didn't know how to do any of it mm -hmm. so I just like I remember the first couple of weeks was mostly spent googling the terms in each task he asked me <laughs> to do and then doing them pretty much yeah, yeah. how big was the team back then and now compared back then the label I think had like three people three or four mm -hmm. but on the management end it was just me and booty so oh so I, you were like really hands-on yeah so it was yeah it was literally just me and booty and he was also juggling like Bitbird at the time, um, as well, which is San's label, yeah. and um, and uh, the label and his label Heroic. So like, I was like the only management employee. So I guess a lot of my time was spent like learning things on the internet about what it is I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. And because I worked remotely, and I still work remotely. I had a lot of time in my hands, like by myself. And literally, like my day would be like I would wake up, I would like look through like a bunch of tasks, and I would just Google a bunch of stuff, and then figure out what to do. Oh wow! How to do it, and then just like do it. Wait, so where are the headquarters? So, Heroic and Bitbridge share an office in The Hague, oh, which is in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, it's like 15 minutes from San, from where like San lives, and all the guys. They have most. So Bitbird has like 80% of its staff there, and then mm -hmm. they have a publicist Ruth 
who works remotely in Boston. And then on the heroic team, it's like 50% is in the office and then the other half is remotely. Mm -hmm. Like I'm in Toronto, like I said. How, how big is Bitbird? Bitbird has maybe, I think seven, six oh, or seven wow. people off the top of my head. Yeah, they've been growing really quickly yeah. since, uh, since, since on Holo Light, which I think was one of the, <laughs> the most fun things I've ever worked on personally. Oh, so you did that all hands on? Yeah, so that campaign. Hey, talk, tell them through that. They're yeah, yeah, about like, that. Um, so like, light just hit a hundred million. Yeah, yes, yesterday. huge. Uh, like, me and San had a little moment. I think <laughs> it was really cute. I think the the, the team Emotional that actually duo. Yeah, very really though. Like the team that actually worked on that record was like me, him, Giannis, who used to work at Heroic Booty, and then this this my colleague Maverick, who still is Heroic. There was like this is the five of us, and like we. Yeah, and it was like, we felt like we had a record that was like really good. Like it was probably, mm -hmm. we felt like it was Son's best record to date. And we were like, we're going to put this out near the end of the year. And like, I want, I personally wanted to line it up with his Porter Robinson and Maddie on tour. Mm -hmm. Because he was about to go on tour with Porter Robinson and Maddie on. Yeah. And I was like, I want to find a way that I can like tie this together forever. Because the Porter Robinson and Maddie on thing, I think was like one of the most iconic events or things of the entire year that year, like 2016. That was probably like the thing of the year as far as EDM goes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I have a way or a chance to like, feel like we can tie this all together somehow. So we managed to get the release date like lined up like right with like San's first show on the tour. Mm -hmm. um, and he like played it for the first time and he like was like, oh, like it looked like it. I felt like, I remember him like, being like, oh, I played it, and like the response is good, and people were like, oh, like tweeting at me, like what was that song and stuff, and then like we put it out like the next week, and then it was just crazy, like it it just blew up. Honestly, like there's no secret sauce in marketing. Honestly, like you're you're only as good as your music is, and mm -hmm. we were lucky to have a really really good record. Yeah. So yeah. then you like did the whole like blog route and then all that, but yeah. then it just became like I mean you did the same things that you would normally do for any release. It just like went we, crazy. Yeah, we we had. We did it for longer. So, oh. yeah, we, we started really early with this release. Like, I remember, like, I think over a month ago, I was at the eight, I was at the I was at the Heroic office during ADE 2016, which mm -hmm. was about a full month before, like, it was, it was over five weeks before the song actually came out. Yeah. And we were talking about this release, and we had everything ready. We got all the assets, we had all the teasers from Torvald, who's, yeah. like, San's art director. We're going to do all of this stuff. And we feel like we have a record that will actually allow us to like push through all the stuff. So like we got a series, we got a premiere on Sirius XM's BPM, which I think was the first time we had gotten like a premiere on BPM. Oh. Uh, this is just this is also like right around the time that the label had like changed the way they were distributing to Spotify. So for the first time, we would go directly to Spotify instead of through a regular distributor. So all of a sudden now we had access to a lot of like Spotify editorial contacts mm -hmm. and, we, and then we, you know, it was just, it was honestly a combination of like good timing and like good luck and luck. Yeah. yeah. But we did the blog stuff, we did the YouTube stuff, yeah. we did social influencer stuff. We were just like learning that this was a thing and we started pitching yeah. social influencers. Like, uh, like who? Um, I didn't handle that directly, oh. but there was a girl who used to work with us, her name is Wendell mm -hmm. and she's awesome and her job was to just like go through YouTubers with like over 1 million, it was like 500,000 plus was the cutoff, mm -hmm. and just like pitch them song songs for usage in their like makeup tutorial videos. Yeah, and then you could just take out the copy. Yeah, right? yeah, we would, you know, we would release a claim and we'd yeah. let them monetize, but like that would open us so he knew a whole new fan base. And I felt like we were pretty early at that relative to most like really, really indie labels and people. Mm -hmm. um, but that definitely worked because there was a lot of like early 2017, about like a month and a half after the song came out, like there was like a lot of makeup tutorials with with like light in them. Mm -hmm. And that I guess like also just added to like the hype. But most of most of it was done on Spotify, like Yeah. Just but you it got did, a lot of the right playlists, must be. Yeah. It it, it was really funny because during the first week we like so like basically what happens is like Every Friday, all of the playlists get refreshed globally, about 80%, mm -hmm. most of which are all of the New Music Fridays. So there's the global New Music Friday, which everyone refers to as New Music Friday. But then there's also like New Music Friday UK, New Music Friday oh, Germany, yeah. New Music Friday Italy. And we were like, okay, so like, there's like a whole big territory out there called the rest of the world. And there's a lot of different playlist editors in a lot of different countries. And we're gonna go pitch all of them. 
which I think not a lot of people realize that we did that. So we went out and pitched like every editor in like every country literally before the song came out. Mm -hmm. And when the song dropped on like the first week, it's, it dropped on, I remember this, Tuesday, November 22nd, 2016. I'm never gonna forget this. The song came out and then on the Friday when all the playlists like refreshed, it was pretty good. Like there was a couple New Music Fridays. It wasn't on the, the global New Music Friday, mm -hmm. but it was also doing really well in SoundCloud at the time. And then we're like, okay, cool. Like the song is doing really well, but like it's mm -hmm. not like doing amazing. But then the next week, um, it got added to like the global New Music Friday and it was added in the second spot. Whoa. Yeah, and we were like, whoa, like what the hell? Like where did this come from? And then it was added simultaneously to Pop Rising, which is like yeah. the feeder pop playlist into the big one, and Hot Rhythmic, which is like another feeder pop playlist that we'd never been in. And these are two like really big playlists, and it's really, really rare to see songs that are in both playlists. To my, in, my, to my, in my knowledge. Yeah. So when I saw that, I was like, whoa, like this is like a, a, like a weird little anomaly. Yeah. And then I think next week we were added to today's top hits, which mm. is like the biggest single playlist on Spotify. And then we were, and then we were like, whoa, like what just happened here? Like yeah. this is like a moment because I think for a song to not be released on a major and to hit today's top hits is like, it's pretty rare. I think yeah. only like three or four or five tops a year, mm. maybe, maybe like a little more than that. But like, this like we had never experienced any of this before and we were like whoa like what is happening like this is such an anomaly and the song just like it just started getting crazy amounts of streams like really it was ridiculous like it's still it's still fun to think about because we were like whoa like it just was a perfect combination of a really yeah. good song really good timing and really good preparation and it just worked out yeah yeah do you think now that you were able to get all this it's kind of like stressful like with all the other songs <laughs> that come out yeah yeah i guess like a part of me doesn't want to be remembered as like a one-hit wonder like creator mm -hmm. like in the sense that like on the marketing sense not like the actual music yeah but i think it's also just hmm it's a really good question like i, I don't feel like there's there's pressure for us yeah. to do it again per se because i think san's music has actually gone in a different direction than what you might have expected off of like the off a of Spotify hit, mm -hmm. but I think it definitely helped us. If anything, it helped us open a lot of doors, which has helped us grow Sans record label Bitbird. It's helped us grow a lot of other artists on the management roster. So I guess it's it's been about like how do we take that success and all the like new contacts and new relationships that are in doors that were open, and just like continue to use that and benefit everything else around him. And like that, all that song also kind of put Son on Spotify's radar, and we knew from like then on, then thereafter, it'd be easy to pitch Son to Spotify oh, just off yeah. the success of that one song. Yeah. Yeah. So like, in short, no, not really. But like, <laughs> it's, yeah, no, not really. It's just about like, what do you do next? Mm -hmm. What kind of advice do you have for people who want to get into management? It's a really good question. I think like the best piece of advice I could give to anybody who wants to work in the music industry is, I guess like the kind of advice that I like got to live through myself. And it mm -hmm. was like, find a skill that you just, it can be any skill, but if you find a skill that you're really good at and you can find a way to monetize it, then you're in a really, really good position. Like for me, it was like Hype Machine. Like I was really good at Hype Machine a couple years ago when it was really, really popping and all the EDM acts were like blowing up on Hype Machine. Like I found out that like I was good at like talking to people and getting songs on Hype Machine blogs. Mm -hmm. And then I monetized that and then once you've done that, I think that's like a really pivotal step in the music industry because there's a lot of people who like will like hustle really hard and like always be working like part time or for free or volunteer. And like if you can find that one thing that you're really good at that you can monetize and that just separates yourself, that separates you from everyone else, mm -hmm. you can kind of leverage that and keep going. Like, of course, you're going to have to keep learning new skills and keep growing off of that. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was like, OK, first it was a hype machine. Then it was like SoundCloud YouTube, and then it was Spotify that we that, that we learned to do like right before Light came out mm -hmm. when I joined like a couple months after I joined Heroic. And then since then it's been like refined social media influence relationships, like understand how to market with a major label team and all the the other like big moving parts in the music industry because I think music industry is a lot bigger than just SoundCloud. And it's taken some people some time to realize that. But I think the sooner you do and the sooner you can realize you can find like useful tools and skills outside of SoundCloud to monetize yourself with, like you're in a really good position. Mm -hmm. What kind of characteristics would you say would be for like good managers? Like a lot of people here, what if they're not sure if management is their thing? I think being really inquisitive 
is one thing that I've seen a lot of good managers and really like people I really respect have, like not even just managers, like people that I really respect in the music industry are people that are like really inquisitive. They're always like asking questions, like how did you guys do this? Like what was the thought process between do, behind doing this instead of doing that? Like how did you do X, Y, Z? And I think that's really, really important. It's to understand that like you definitely don't know everything in the music industry and there's always ways that you can be doing something better that you might not necessarily know about it. And it's to like talk with other people who are doing a similar thing and realize how they're doing it and what you can be learning from them. And then I think being, having a calm, I feel like being really calm and really zen, quote unquote, mm -hmm. is something that's really important. Like, oh, this is like happy. <laughs> yeah, no, don't say that. Like, you don't necessarily have to be calm and zen, but I think to like kind of walk into a room and mm -hmm. have like a lot of gravitas, I think is like an under underrated thing in the music industry because mm -hmm. kind of because I feel like there's like a lot of noise like there's a lot of like big egos a lot oh, of brash yeah. people talking all the time but like if you're able to like walk into a situation and kind of just like assess and read and like be really calm mm -hmm. and kind of like have a calming influence on everybody I think that's like super valuable for the artists that you like manage what kind of like media training do you do okay so interesting so like usually one thing we're working on right now with San's album is like we're really trying to get the messaging across mm -hmm. and kind of like I'll give him a bunch of like words that I like that I personally feel like fans will relate to and like the media likes. I'll give him a bunch of words and he'll try and like use that in the interviews and stuff that he talks about mm -hmm. like kind of common common talking points and common themes so that if somebody's reading like three or four like son interviews and watches like sidewalk talk there's like kind mm -hmm. of a common thread about it and then like for video interviews I know it can be awkward sometimes when you've never done a video interview especially for an artist who usually has spent most of his time kind of like either with other artists or just yeah. collabing in his bedroom by himself yeah. like I guess like I always just try and try and tell them like to think about a question and listen to it you don't have to answer right away but I always feel like you want to give an answer that's at least two sentences mm. and the best possible answer to a question is always an answer that allows the reader or the interviewer actually to give you a question that yeah. falls back immediately after and then all of a sudden you're framing your own narrative oh, even I wish though you're, some I interviewed yeah, had this. it's like even though you're being narrated even though you're the one being interviewed you actually have the most control over the entire narrative mm -hmm. if you can shift the interview one way or the other based on the direction um, yeah <laughs> Well, More artists should watch this advice. <laughs> oh, I guess like my, my actual like role at Heroic is actually like marketing manager. Yeah. Um. So I guess like that's what I'm versed at. I guess marketing. Mm -hmm. What would you say have been your biggest challenges as a manager? Going from like it's been it's been the entire journey pretty much. Like, yeah. From figuring out what I wanted to do in the music industry after like experimenting with blogs and stuff mm -hmm. until like realizing that like there's such a high there's like so much stuff you can be doing in the music industry like if you really like put your mind to learn about all the different assets like I only knew about blogging when I joined Heroic like I literally knew nothing besides reposts YouTube world like the YouTube SoundCloud world and like yeah. blogs like hype machines I knew nothing else and then like over the years I've learned about publishing administration I've learned about touring I've learned about routing on that and I've learned about advancing I've learned about like withholding tax like a bunch of really really yeah. random stuff and I think my biggest challenge is always to be like what is something that I feel like I know a little bit, but I don't know well enough to go into a conversation mm. with someone and actually know what I'm talking about. And it's like finding that and then trying to learn on all those different things that I'm not, like, not super comfortable explaining to people. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something I don't usually ask people in music industry, but because I've asked everyone on Sun's team, what does love mean to you? What does love mean to me? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a perfect question for San and Haley and I asked them. I yeah. asked them both. Andrew Liu. <laughs> you sh yeah, you should. This. I, oh, I like that. Love means to me, um, waking up each day and being interested in what I'm actually doing. I think like I have the luxury as a 23 year old and being able to say like I wake up at my first job and I actually look forward to what's happening like, rare, like yeah. yeah I think that's rare among other 23 year olds like where I wake up I'm like this is great like I have so much stuff to do today that I actually love and I'm like super invested into it emotionally and and yeah and I guess that's kind of a cop-out answer but um that's oh, that's yeah. what love is to me love is love is <laughs> love, my love is work love is my career yeah um <laughs> And all my artists and my girlfriend, shout out Carmen. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. what love is to me. Last question, what do you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for working with artists that were 
sonically ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be like, I feel like, the, I think everyone at Hurric would agree with this, but we want to be known as like a really curated bunch of managers with like a really, really talented roster. Like mm. just to like, so, just to like plug, like I feel like Son is like, you know, three years ago, he was like one of the first people doing Future Bass, like three, mm. four years ago. Now he's completely reinvented his sound with a guitar. Like yeah. he's really challenging himself and like we're really excited to see where that's going. He's writing his album right now. It's going to be really, really great. We think. <laughs> we um, think. <laughs> we think. No, we know. We know. We hope you guys think that though. Um, like Tosca and Drulu, like they're super, super talented. They're all like traditionally trained musicians. Oh. So not just programmers. I feel like that's a really good advantage. And unlike Pluto, who's been doing stuff with like Monster Cat in the past, and he had like a pretty big Spotify hit with Everything Black. Like mm -hmm. he's also changing the way his project looks and feels. And then our, you, our newest and youngest artist, Fitch, we feel like he's like a moody James Blake. Like musically, he's like bass music with like a real songwriting twist is what mm. Moody always says. And like at the end of the day, I just want to be remembered by what my artists do. And that's yeah. all. Like that's yeah. all. Yeah. I love that. Thank you yeah. so much. No worries. <laughs> this is awesome. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye.